So thank you so much. I hope you can see me as well as the presentation now. Yeah, we see you. Perfect. So hello everyone and welcome to this short talk about the computational hierarchy of elementary cellular automata. My name is Barbara and I study PhD in mathematics at the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics at Charles University Prague. And I'm a member of a research team led by Tomasz Mikolov at the Czech Technical University in Prague. And there our team is interested in studying dynamical systems as possible models of artificial evolution. And naturally some dynamical systems seem to be good models and some to be worse models of artificial evolution. And it boils down to the fact that some dynamical systems uh, we can observe uh, inside of them that they have some spontaneously emerging structures which further grow in complexity. And so it boils down to the big question of how to measure the complexity of a dynamical system. And there have been many various approaches um, designed in the past. And the one that I favor the most now is to view complexity as a computational capacity of the, th of the system. I think it is somehow natural because intuitively, if some dynamical system is able to compute hard tasks, uh, it is intrinsically complex. And also, hopefully, if we ever ever achieve some artificially evolving systems with intelligent structures, we would want to harvest uh, their usefulness and make them compute some uh, challenging tasks for us. So we, we are striving to search for systems with high computational capacity. And so the question that uh, we're interested in is how to objectively measure the computational capacity of a dynamical system. To make it very easy for us is to start with the toy class of cellular automata and to make it even easier is to work with elementary cellular automata. I'm sure everyone knows what it is. They are mappings of um, discrete grid of cells. Each cell can be in the state zero or one represented by white and black colors of the squares and the grid can be, for example, the first row of the picture is then updated based on a local rule, which is a ternary Boolean function. And what you see here is space time diagram of the simulation of a particular uh, elementary CPA where time is progressing words. And so since there are only 256 of them, we can exhaustively compare their properties to based with a particular, I don't know, uh, aspect that we want to measure inside of them. And uh, why cellular automata? Well, I like that uh, they are these base case of dynamical systems and they are super simple to describe, yet uh, they uh, offer us these fascinating visualizations of their dynamics. And this allows us to build intuition as to what is complex and what is not. And it would be really cool to um, answer the hypothesis whether the systems that intuitively look complex with these structures forming are actually the ones with the highest computational capacity. Or in other words, some system look chaotic with just um, white noise, it seems. And it would be cool to answer that such systems, for example, do not have a large computational capacity. And so let us view CA as computing systems. Uh, the classical way is that we have some computational problem problem and we encode its instance to some initial configuration of the cellular automaton. Then we let it run for a couple of time steps and then we decode the final configuration to obtain the solution to our problem. Uh, now the hard part is fixing the encoder and decoder, decoder in such a way to um, make it a successful uh, computation, right? And um, since the encoders and decoders usually their space grows exponentially with increasing the grid size. It is a hard uh, search problem. But for example, the majority task, which is uh, classically um, regarded, is a task where we just want the cellular automaton to output whether there was a majority of zeros and ones in its initial configuration. And so that's a lovely task because the encoder is very natural. It's just an identity function and we compute straight on the initial configurations of the CA. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not challenging enough and it does not seem exciting to have a CA which is only able to compute the majority task. So if we think of some 
larger set of more challenging tasks. For example, we would like to determine how many Boolean functions is a particular CA able to compute. Then we have the problem uh, of searching for the encoders and decoders, as I said. And if we find a positive result, then it's nice because the encoder and decoder witness it. But if we want to prove a negative result, then we have to say that for all encoders and decoders, it holds that it cannot compute the particular task. And that seems unfeasible to do without more theoretical insight. And the last more, most classical task of um, or an formal approach of how to persuade an audience that a particular cellular automaton is indeed complex is to embed a universal Turing machine inside, which of course is um, a good reason to believe that such a CA would be complex. But on the other hand, we are embedding a serial computational device into a parallel environment. And so we are not using its full capacity of the parallel computations. So it might not be the ideal computational model to embed inside. And so for me, uh, an ideal set of benchmark tasks should consist of tasks suitable for the parallel environment of cellular automata. And at the same time, it should be challenging enough. And also for a given CA and a task T, it should be effectively verifiable whether the CA can compute the task. And so for a fixed class C of cellular automata, you can, for example, imagine elementary cellular automata. A natural task is the following. Given a CA in the class C, how many other CA in the same class can it simulate? And so it boils down to the question of how to define C, uh, when is a particular CA able to simulate another one. And then we have a very natural set of tasks um, um, making use of the parallel environment. And so I would like to mention these two important prior works, one by Israeli and Goldenfeld, who have introduced the notion of simulation being the CA coarse grainings, getting inspired by the physical notion of uh, renormalization. And somehow a dual notion to this is a bulking of cellular automata um, introduced by these four authors. And if you're interested in these notions, which also have very cool mathematical interpretations, uh, I really recommend uh, reading these papers. Uh, so the, in the next part of the talk, I will uh, explain what uh, my definition of CA emulation. It is actually very similar to the bulking one. And then I will show you the results on the elementary CA class and some implications. And so suppose we have two cellular automata, rule 184 and rule 148, and I I want to show you, I will define it on an example so that hopefully it's going to be more understandable. We say that rule 148 uh, emulates rule 184 with a supercell of size 2 if there exists an encoding uh, of the simple cells of 0 and 1 to a cells of size 2. That, um, that means that it's a supercell of size 2. So it's a sequence of two squares now such that Whatever initial configurations we feed to the weaker cellular automaton, we can encode the configuration bit by bit. So this zero square is mapped to two zeros, the one square is mapped to a zero and one and so on. So that after one time step of simulating the rule 184, we essentially get the same result as by running the rule 148 for uh, two time steps. And you can notice that in the middle time step, it can do whatever it wants, but at the end, the final initial configuration, the final configuration has to be a valid encoding of the correct result of the one time step of the simpler rule. So in some sense, we have a commuting diagram. Um, if you would like to uh, read more about this in maybe more formal manner. Uh, I recommend reading the paper where this is written properly. But what it essentially means is that there is a special subset of initial configurations or, um, of rule 148, which are valid encodings. And once we start with a valid encoding, then every two time steps, we end up with a valid encoding. And it's not just a, any valid encoding, it's the valid encoding of the correct result of simulating the emulated rule for one time step. 
So in, some, in this sense, we get a pre-order. We can say that the rule 148 emulates rule 184 by using this relation notion. And it can easily be shown that it is a transitive relation and that whatever computation the weaker rule can do, the stronger rule can do as well. I think, so this are some nice notions of the order that we would like to have. You can probably see it more from here. So here we see the space-time diagram of rule 184. And here uh, we have encoded the initial configuration to be a valid encoding of the rule 148. And then I'm just depicting every two time steps of the computation of rule 148. And you see that the space-time diagrams really look equivalent. Um, and in some sense, rule 184 was proven to um, or shown to be able to compute the majority task. And now we know that with just a very simple encoding, rule 148 is able to compute the same task in some sense. And so uh, what is so nice about this definition is that it has a very cool algebraic um, formalism it basically means that rule 184 is a subalgebra of rule 148 of some power of the algebra. So uh, just exploiting this algebraic insight, I was able to design an algorithm which computes the or searches for the encodings reasonably fast to be able to compute all the relations of supercells up to size 11 for all the elementary cellular automata to obtain this computational hierarchy. What you're seeing is the elementary CA rules, and there is an edge from a CA above to a CA below whenever the CA above is able to emulate the CA below. So, of course, I couldn't compute all the supercell sizes, so this is just a partial hierarchy, but I would like to point out one result. You see this bottom, these are the only four rules which were not able to simulate any other rule. Even the simple rule zero, which is just constantly mapping everything to zero, is able to emulate itself, non-trivially, but these rules are not able to emulate anything uh, with a supercell larger than one. And so what is interesting about this is that the two rules at the bottom are just the two most chaotic rules according to various metrics of chaos. And these two rules are just their symmetries. So in some sense, it seems that the most chaotic CAs are the ones unable to emulate any other CA. So in some sense, unable to do any computation. Now, this seemed exciting because it is a very interesting ongoing debate whether chaotic CA can do any computation. They seem to be better for reservoir computing, but we are unable to embed Turing machines inside them because we see no structures forming. And this is another experimental result supporting the um, intuition that maybe they are not able to compute anything because they cannot emulate any other rule, even a constant rule. And so this led to uh, me thinking of or trying to define uh, chaos, a new version of chaos for discrete systems for cellular automata. And I would say, and I call it the computational chaos, and we say a cellular automaton is computationally chaotic if it cannot emulate any other CA with a supercell larger than one. And why do I connect this to chaos? So in some sense, chaos for me in discrete systems means that the system is somehow unpredictable. I cannot effectively predict its long-term dynamics other than simulating the system itself. Uh, and indeed, if there is a rule being able to emulate another rule, it means that two time steps of the computation, I can simulate just by one step of the computation of the simple rule, and thus explaining the dynamics of a special subset of configurations, and the subset being the valid encodings of the emulation. So if a CA is able to emulate something else, then at least part of its dynamics can be um, explained more efficiently by just running the weaker CA, uh, which predicts its dynamics more effectively. But since the rules 30 and 45 don't seem to be able uh, to emulate any other thing, in some sense, they are intrinsically computationally chaotic. No, no part of its, no subset of its configurations uh, can be, or the dynamics run from a sub from no subset of initial configurations can be explained more efficiently at least that is the hypothesis 
And so this is maybe more theoretical, less applicable, but uh, some future work I am interested in is to derive theoretical results using the algebraic tools that uh, um, I learned at school to prove some formal properties of CA emulation. For example, to show at least something about uh, cellular automata, which are linear. The hypothesis is that linear cellular automata can only emulate themselves and no other rules. And it's good to prove some negative results saying that there exists no encoded, no encoding such that the linear CA could emulate anything else. So that would be a cool result. Also, since the notions of CA emulation and coarse graining are dual, it would be cool to establish some relationship and implications between them. And also one downside of the uh, definition as it is now is that it seems to be too strict because the encoding is local. Even if there is a cellular automaton, which is just a symmetry of another cellular automaton by switching the roles of the left and right neighbors, we get a space-time diagram, which is just a reflection of uh, the space-time diagram of the symmetric rule across the um, y-axis. But so these two rules would seem to be computing the same thing in some sense, because there's, yeah, there's a good correspondence between their space-time diagrams. Because this encoding is local and it does not account for these large symmetries, uh, it would not discover such rules as being able to emulate one another. So then the question is, how can we design other notions of emulation which would be more benevolent in this sense? And also how to extend these emulation notions to other dynamical systems, which are maybe of more interest to people now, such as random Boolean networks or neural nets. So this is it. Thank you so much for your attentions. And I would be happy to answer any questions now or in Slack or whenever. Thank you very much. Again, virtual applause, a really fascinating talk. We do have time for um, some questions if anybody has uh, got them. Sorry, I'm scrolling through to see anyone's putting their hand up. Um, one quick question from me. Um, you said the chaotic rules can't uh, emulate anything. Can, what do, I, I couldn't see rule 110 in, in, the, in your chart. Can, can that emulate everything given that it's, uh, <laughs> given it's complete? Uh, sorry, you're muted. Sorry, Barbara, you're muted. Sorry, sorry, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I was also interested in this and it would be cool if the rule that we all think is complex would be able to emulate everything, but in some sense, emulating everything is a stronger notion than just being Turing complete. Mm. And for rule 110, we know that it's Turing complete, but not in an effective way. I've seen the proof and it's just a large embedding. Yeah. And so maybe I would have to uh, search for encodings of super large size to witness the power of rule 110. But what's interesting is that rule 110 I only discovered could emulate the constant zero rule and the smallest encoding for which it could do it was uh, supercells of size 10. So maybe if I could go, if the computational power would enable me to go further, I would uh, discover it emulating other rules, but so far it didn't really go too well. So in some sense, it might be Turing complete, but maybe it's not effectively Turing complete. So in some sense, this also tells us something about the effectivity, considering the supercell size. But every, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. It's kind of the complement of your chaotic ones. Very nice idea there, but then that other one. We just have one in the, in the chat. Are, are, are these emulations found by exhaustive search or do you have a faster way of doing it? In some sense, yes, uh, but I'm not trying all the different encodings. On the other hand, I'm uh, kind of computing all two element subalgebras of the cellular automata, and then I'm seeing what are they isomorphic to, and that gives me the encoding. So in the paper, I analyze the effectivity, and it's slightly better than exhaustive search in this sense. Always better to be. It's always good to be better than exhaustive search and not worse than exhaustive search. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are there any more questions? I, I think Tom Glover's got his hand up. Tom. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk, Barbara. It's very nice. Uh, so I was, I'm very interested in this concept where you uh, criticize uh, these sort of um, 
standard ways to, to put up uh, universal computation, right? This, this sort of computers that you find in 110 is not like a parallel computer, right? And you talk about trying to find a suitable parallel benchmark earlier, right? Do you have any uh, intuitions of which one that would be? Because I'm very interested in that topic. Uh, so that's the hard questions that I uh, um, that I want to tackle in the first place because I started with measuring how many Boolean functions SCA can compute, and it just seemed that the choice of when I read out the output, uh, how do I embed the input, was too arbitrary for me to give the results with confidence. And then we moved to these more natural tasks. So for me right now, the best option that I know of is this CA emulation because. Uh, if I can show that a CA is able to emulate another CA, uh, um, I'm using its parallel nature. The embedding seemed to be quite natural, and that's why I studied it. But it's an ongoing, uh, of course, uh, thinking process. What's the best uh, benchmark computational task for mm -hmm. the parallel environment? If anyone has any ideas or tips or papers, I would love to read about this more. There are some non-benchmark approaches to measuring the computational capacity of reservoirs. And yeah. given that you can use CAs as reservoirs, maybe you two ought to talk to one another more. Um, because <laughs> you're using CAs as reservoirs, you want to know the computational capacity of CAs. Maybe there's something something there. It'd be really great fun to look at that. Agreed. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any further questions? No, okay. Well, I'd like to thank all the speakers of the sessions today. Thank you very much for, for doing that. And so I'll sort of applaud for everybody. And um, it's now coffee, tea, lunch, dinner, middle of the night gap for, um, for half an hour for wherever you are in the world. You've got half an hour off now. Sylvia, did you want to say anything? You just sort of appeared. Is there any final housekeeping you want to say? No, no, no. Right. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, everybody, and see you later. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.